what we wanted to do today is to take your questions, your advocacy questions, and uh, but to start off with the idea that educating yourself before you try to educate other people is really imperative. And you know, we get all sorts of questions about, well, should we be um, should we participating in events by slaughterhouse and stopping trucks and things like that. I think there are problems with that, and I'm happy to talk about those problems with you. Um, or should we be standing in various geometrical shapes in public places, wearing masks and talking to people, not talking to people, but um, trying to get them interested in talking to, to some spokespeople about veganism? The answer is, look, you should always talk about veganism. So I'm really glad that people are talking about veganism and not promoting take the pray from pork. The problem is, is that in many of these cases, these events are more social events for animal advocates and not educational opportunities for people. Um, you know, they're not, they're not um, opportunities in which people are educating other people. This is a serious problem. And in a lot of cases, you know, we've talked to people who have been involved in these sorts of events and they don't really know very much about abolition. They know that they're not supposed to promote animal welfare reform, but they don't really understand how they're supposed to talk to people, what message they're supposed to promote in terms of veganism as a moral baseline and abolition. They, they often promote single issue campaigns, which is completely inconsistent with the abolitionist approach to animal rights. They often hand out literature, even if they don't promote animal welfare reform per se, they'll hand out literature from animal welfare group, things like that. This is a serious problem. If we're going to educate people, we need to educate ourselves first. So you've got to spend some time learning about abolitionist theory if you're going to talk to people about abolition. And that was the whole point of why we wrote Eat Like You Care and Animal Rights, the Abolitionist Approach, and the most recent book, Advocate for Animals. The whole, I, the whole point of those three books was to explain the theory in really accessible ways so that you didn't have to get heavily into stuff you didn't really want to get into or you weren't interested in. But it was an opportunity for you to learn in a simple way, the basics of the abolitionist theory. Now, you know, if you don't want to do that, then that's your choice. But then you've got to understand, you're, if you don't understand the theory, you're not going to really be able to teach other people. You're not going to really be able to convey it to other people. Whether you're standing, you know, in a geometrical pattern in some public place wearing a mask or whether you're having some, some other, however you're doing it, you're not going to be an effective educator. And that's a serious problem. And one thing I want to um, uh, stress and I want to encourage people about is that some of the most effective advocacy that you can engage in is integrating discussions about abolitionist veganism into your everyday life, into your regular Absolutely. encounters with people, so that you're not talking at people or making a speech. There's, there's times and opportunities perhaps for Absolutely. that sort of presentation, but most of us need to have discussions with other people about, about important issues. And if you, if you do the homework that Gary was just talking about, so that you have in your own mind what your response would be to the 20 or 30 questions that you're probably um, going to be asked with some regularity, if you, if you work out in your own mind what you would be comfortable and satisfied with as a response, then you're going to be able to have the give and take of the sort of encounter that really sticks with people, that makes sense with people, that doesn't cause people to recoil and say, you know, this person's attacking me or talking at me. You're having a discussion about something that's important to you and that someone else can engage with, in, with you. And those are the sorts of encounters where ideas really stick where you will have an opportunity to follow up and show how these ideas have been important in your own life so that you can encourage other people to see their importance for their lives too. So a bit of time spent every day on, um, on the Abolitionist Approach website or looking at the questions that we answered uh, for you at the back of Eat Like You Care or reading a few pages of the Advocate for Animals book will make you more confident before you go out and have discussions with people. Yeah, yeah so that's, that's interesting. interesting. Um, uh, what, one, one of the one other, other organisations that's run up in recent years are these um, 
are these organisations that deal with, I think they call themselves the SAVE movement, where they, they bear witness. Um, they they uh, photograph animals in slaughterhouse trucks and everything, uh, that sort of thing. And I think they also, I may be wrong about this, but I think they also organise some of these slaughterhouse sit-ins or lockdowns, I think, um, and wait to be unceremoniously removed from the premises. Uh, what do, you, do, do you think that these, these types of activities have any value at all? No, I actually think they're counterproductive. I think they're also really, I mean, some of the ones I've seen, you know, you've got people, well, animals are terrified when they're on their way to slaughter. They're, I mean, the whole process is a terrifying process. So they're going to be slaughtered anyway. The idea that we're going to stop the truck so that we can, quote, bear witness, I don't even know what that means. Um, you know, we're going to bear witness, um, which generally involves people being emotional, sticking their hands into the trucks, um, taking selfies of themselves being emotional, taking selfies of themselves standing against the trucks, taking pictures of the animals, putting, uh, ex you know, sticks, extender sticks with cameras at the end to take pictures of the animals. This is not helpful. This is delaying the inevitable. These animals are going to be slaughtered anyway. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't understand this idea of bearing witness. Um, we all know where animals, we all know where meat comes from. We all know where dairy comes from. We all know where eggs come from. So, I mean, you know, when you drive up the, you know, the highway, you see trucks go on their way to the slaughterhouse. You see them all the time. I see them all the time. Most people see them, you know, quite regularly. And so this idea that, well, we're going to bear witness. We're going to stop the truck. The animals are, are terrified. We're going to stop the truck and we're going to bear witness. That's about at, that's about the people participating. It has nothing to do with the animals. Um, as far as you know, the, the 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 slaughterhouse lockdowns are concerned. Again, that's theater. I mean, that's theater. People delude themselves into believing that that's quote activism. It's theater. Um, the slaughterhouses aren't the problem. The problem is the people who are demanding the products of the slaughterhouse. If people stop demanding those products, the slaughterhouses would not be in operation. You don't deal with slaughterhouses by shutting them down temporarily or whatever, because the same some number of animals are going to be killed anyway. I mean, and these are these are. I mean, there's a certain there's, there's just a, a, such an incredible amount of gimmickry in the animal movement, just gimmicks, um, you know, the which are mostly fundraising, you know, for fundraising purposes and for branding purposes. So this organization gets the brand for going into stores and conducting funeral rituals in the meat department, or this this group gets the brand of bearing, I mean, you know, this this group has the brand of wearing masks and standing in, in public places showing slaughterhouse videos. I mean, this is gimmickry. And it's not that you're um, exposing a hidden crime or you've discovered a CIA black site where torture is taking place. One only needs to go to one's local supermarket to be reminded what's going on. Everybody does know that right. those things that are packaged in the refrigerated cases are dead animals. So we've, we've tried to distance ourselves from it, but... It, it's accessible to us with a simple conversation. We don't need to go to the slaughterhouse. Now, the slaughterhouse operators may be happy to keep the general public away from the constant reminder of the actual moment of death and the process of death that got that product into the refrigerated section of your supermarket. But a discussion really can can get the, those issues on the table. So if you want to talk about abolitionist veganism, I am very concerned that the animals themselves are simply props in those yeah. in those situations. Yeah. You cannot talk down an animal who's on a truck going to slaughter, reassure them that everything's fine. Um, they're not, they have no relationship with you. They're not looking for reassurance with a bond with a human being. You're not making it any better. You're, you may well be prolonging the situation and a bunch of faces and flashing lights and noises and everything, um, uh, those horrible holes in um, uh, animal transport vehicles is not helping the animals who are confined inside them. So there are so many opportunities um, to talk to your fellow human beings. They're the, they're the problem. Your fellow human beings are creating the situation. 
And it, it's not an event. Um, it's not about you. We don't have to have a public display of emotion. And it's, it's, I'm sure it's deeply felt. And we've all encountered something that's really hit at us emotionally. But we can come up with a solution and communicate solutions in a, in a non-dramatic, not apart from our everyday lives situation. But that, as we were saying before, requires some preparation, some self-discipline, uh, a bit of work, and a willingness to put oneself out there without being the focus of attention, but to communicate important ideas. I have never been on one of these events. I don't intend to, but I do a lot of vegan advocacy. And I think all of us participating today can find a venue, can find a way of speaking and, and presenting the ideas that you're comfortable with, that we all find useful and productive um, without without the drama and the, as Gary was saying, almost gimmickry. You know, well, I've had people involved in the SAVE movement tell me that they form bonds with these animals in the slaughter trucks, you know, that there's communication. And, and, and you know, I, I'm sure these people believe this, but um, that's, that's um, silly. Um, animals on their way to slaughter are terrified. And the idea that we're developing some relationship or we're comforting them, uh, is absurd. There's no comforting an animal in a slaughter truck. Uh, absolutely none. And the idea that people are stopping those vehicles and prolonging the terror and absolutely blind distress and panic that those animals are in uh, and experiencing it is bewildering to me, actually. It really is. It's, I, I find it really disturbing. Um, and again, I mean, as the animals are the props, you know, animal, you know, animals are, are gimmicks that are used to brand organizations. Um, and, you, you know, the only way we're ever going to stop this is by is through an intelligent and intelligible campaign of educating people about about why veganism is a moral imperative. That's the only way it's, it stops. Also, I want to say something about, you know, the use of violent imagery. One of the things I've learned over many years of doing this is you can show people slaughterhouse videos till you're blue in the face. And, you know, it'll, it upset, it, they're gory. I mean, how, however, you know, whatever, you know, they're horrible. Uh, most people respond to those things by saying, oh, that's really terrible. They ought to be doing it in a better way. Um, that's a serious problem. If you don't educate people about why it's wrong to be treating animals as resources, irrespective of how supposedly humanely we're using them, that's an invitation. That's a that will that will uh, keep them from going vegan because they'll be more interested in campaigns to get closed circuit televisions into slaughterhouses or to make sure that, that the, the supposed, quote, abuses are, are dealt with. Um, and, and, and they won't, it doesn't matter. That's the thing. It doesn't really matter how we exploit them. It matters that we exploit them. Slaughter will never be a pretty sight. Uh, however it's done, it's never going to, it's always going to be something we'll recoil from. However, however it's done, if it's done in complete conformity with the regulation, it doesn't matter. It's going to be horrible. Um, but the idea is not to focus people on the abuses or on, you know, on, on the particular horrors of the slaughterhouse. Because the reaction is almost invariably, well, we ought to do something to make that better. And what we've got to do is to get people to sort of focus on the fundamental injustice that we're exploiting these animals in the first place, that we're killing them for no reason. I mean, we, we don't even have to have a complicated discussion about this. It's not it's 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 not even a matter of 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 um, any necessity. All of this violence is is completely unnecessary because we don't need to be eating, wearing, or using animals. So, I mean, I think we, 
And, and the thing that I find most interesting is when you explain it to people this way, they understand it, you know, and, and, you know, I was doing a radio show the other night and it was a British radio show. And I was talking to the host and saying, look, it's not just a matter. It's, it, it really isn't a matter of how we're doing it. Obviously, less suffering is better than more suffering. But that's not the point. The point is, why are we doing it at all? And I think anybody who was listening to that show would come to the conclusion that the host started off very skeptical about veganism. And by the time we were done, I think he was totally engaged with it. Now, is he going to become a vegan? I have no idea. But he understood what was what I was saying. And we kept the discussion away from the 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 idea. I mean, because he he was saying, well, you know, but look, I agree. It's when well, you know these factory farms are terrible, and we ought not to be abusing animals. And and I was saying, well, look, you know, it, it's. It's not a matter of how we're doing it. It's that we're doing it. That's what we need to focus on. And so I think that, you know, this whole approach of let's show people gory movies um, or, you know, let's, let's, you know, stop slaughter. I mean, I, this is in, in many ways, really, I think, um, problematic ways of proceeding. And we, at least we need to think about these things and discuss them. This is the problem is that oftentimes, you know, if I, if I raise these things on the Facebook page, the people who do these things don't even bother. It's, they just get angry. You know, it's like, does anybody really believe that they're establishing a relationship with an animal in a slaughter truck? I mean, does anybody really believe that? Anyway. No. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, along with the rise of the groups that we've, um, we've been discussing, there's been, in recent years, a number of people who are now professional activists, not the traditional, not the traditional animal charities, but individuals who uh, they have Patreon accounts and this kind of thing, um, and uh, they rely on donations from presumably other vegans uh, to, to fund their activism. So they're effectively professional activ activists. Um, do you think that these that, that there can ever really be an effective professional activists for, for animal rights, or does there come a time when there's almost inevitably going to be some sort of moral compromise in order to pay the bills effectively? I'm sure there is. There, there is the ten, there's a history of that, and uh, it would be so very surprising if this, this phenomenon of the, of the uh, public-supported uh, professional activist um, didn't have the same problems. But why is anyone sending... Uh, financial support so someone else can do the activism? Why are they not educating themselves and doing the advocacy in their own circle of, of colleagues, acquaintances, and family? That's where they can have the effect. So just as it's been all too easy to uh, through the years to send your $15 into the large animal groups and say, go and do it on my behalf, and we all know how poorly that's turned out, I have no no reason to think that this will not turn out any better. But the whole model is wrong. This is not, this is not, um, for most people, this should not be a, a job. Um, it, it's, as we say, it's um, informed communication with people in your own circle or people that you extend your circle to, to meet and encounter and, and, and have supported conversations with. That, I believe, is where abolitionists advocacy is best done, uh, not with someone who's trying to find, um, a, you know, a gimmick in their presentation to stand out and, and be the new YouTube star. We don't need that. We need people um, talking to friends, family, colleagues, people that they meet in the supermarket, in the vet's office, in the doctor's office, in the hospital, in, on the train station, on the plane, any time where you're spending time um, in close proximity with other people. There's your audience. But it requires you to do something, and sometimes that's not something you're terribly comfortable with, and you get better the more you do it. But I think that's where grassroots advocacy uh, really has its strongest effect, and that's the only way that the message is going to get out because um, personalities rear up and are popular and are supported, and then people go on to the next one. It's not that this is 
really multiplying the opportunities for education. It's just moving from one fashionable person to the next one. I find it disheartening, and I think we need to get onto grassroots um, outreach um, on the animal issue and lots of other issues too, if anything is going to change. Yeah, I, I think um, that's absolutely right. I mean, I've seen instances where some of these people actually do uh, present the problem that you're describing, Alan, where they basically, they, they rise as celebrities and then the next thing you know, they're working closely with welfareist groups uh, and or they're taking financial support from welfareist groups and they change their message. I, actually, there, there's a, you know, uh, a number of instances of that. But even if that doesn't happen, even if uh, even if people don't compromise themselves by becoming involved in those groups, the whole, as Anna says, the whole model is wrong. There's really no difference between the problem of I don't do activism. I send my money to some welfare organization that does the wrong sort of activism. Um, even if you're sending your money to somebody who supposedly, although I question this, is doing the right sort of activism, why aren't you doing it yourself? That's the problem. The problem, as Anna says, is the model. It doesn't really matter whether you're sending your money to a welfareist group or you're sending it to some someone who, you know, doesn't want to have a job so that, you know, can, they can get money from people who do have jobs so that they can travel around the world and do all the things that, that the people who have the jobs who contribute the money don't really have the opportunity to do, but they can travel around and go from country to country on, on someone else's uh, uh, money. Uh, I mean, the, the problem with that is clear. Why aren't people doing the activism themselves? Why, yes. why Why? do we even need these people to base? I mean, they're not saying anything original. Um, so, I mean, all they're doing is just basically saying things that other people have come up with. That's fine. I mean, but why, why should people be giving them money to do that and travel around the world and do that? Um, I mean, it's this idea, it's this, this savior idea that, you know, that we're going to pay these people and they're going to go around and they're going to be activists. Um, first of all, that relieves you of, you know, you give exactly. money to these people and it relieves you of the obligation to do anything. So you think you're doing something by supporting one of these people. You don't need to more. be watching other people. Exactly. We need exactly. To get ourselves mm. prepared, um, you know, in terms of background and in terms of emotion, because this is an emotional issue for lots of people and, and a good healthy dose of self-discipline. So you get out there and do something, even if it isn't your favorite thing to do. It needs to be done. So we all need to do it. We don't need to watch the latest person who's reared up as, you know, the, the flavor of the month. Um, and there's also... It's, it's everyday work and everyday commitment. There's also, you know, um, there's also an aspect of this about, you know, lo local... The last thing in the world most people are really interested in is somebody flying in from right. some pl some other place and some celebrity who comes in to tell them uh, about how they should think about a moral issue. Moral issues and, and moral thinking is best influenced by people uh, that we have relationships with and people that we know, people that are parts of our communities, members of our communities. And so... I think that, you know, this idea, this whole model of, you know, the professional activist who flies in and, you know, organizes this or organize, people can, or, I mean, th this doesn't, this is not rocket science. I mean, that was the, that, that, that's the, the point. This is not rocket science. We're trying to change, shift the paradigm. The only way we can do that is to creative, nonviolent, vegan advocacy. We're not going to get anywhere by being violent to people. We're not going to get anywhere by yelling at people. I think it's absolutely counterproductive. These events where people go into restaurants and scream and yell and things like that, that's idiocy in my view. I mean, that is just, that's not activism. It's idiocy. Um, and so I, I think that, um, you know, that stuff's really counterproductive. But, you know, if we're going to change it, We've got to educate ourselves, educate other people, and not 
not accept this model that, you know, we're going to give, we're going to contribute to somebody else and they're going to do the activism. They can't do it. We need to, if this is going to work, we need each of us has to become a leader. Each of us has to become, you know, somebody who is out there educating. It's not a question of giving the money to, 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 to somebody who's going to travel from place to place and have an extended vacation going from country to country. It's a matter of individuals doing it and in their own communities where they're talking with their friends, with their colleagues, with the people at work, the people at school, the people that they encounter. You know, I mean, tabling in your community is a tremendously effective way of educating people. You don't have, I mean, you know, there are other ways of doing it, but I mean, but that's one way of doing it. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't have the drama of, you know, wearing masks and showing people gory things, but, you know, you educate yourself, you understand things, you go out there, you talk to people. And, and education is a process that requires a give and take. You're not really going to get very far by having a very short, sort of short interaction where you don't even know what you're talking about and you, you know, you, you, you mouth a couple of slogans. You need to be able to, to engage people. And I think those of us who do this, we see this all the time that, you know, you get people involved in discussing things, you know, and that's how you change things. That's how you, that's how not, not in some sort of short, you know, uh, uh, exchange, but, you know, I mean, obviously you don't have time uh, uh, necessarily for a lengthy exchange in all cases. But, you know, let's get away from the gimmickry. Let's get away from the, the, you know, the branding. And let's get focused on the hard work of educating people. But that's something we each of us have to, you know, each of us has to do. Okay, well, we've got a, we've got a couple of related questions on this one. Um, the first one's from Tejas. Uh, and I think you've actually already answered this one, so I won't get you to answer it again. He says, what do you think about the hero worshipping in the in the activist community? And he's referred to the, the three, probably the most well-known of the people that we've been discussing, uh, James Aspie, Joey Carbstrong, and Earthling Ed. Not that I don't, I'm sure he's not picking on them, but he's just mentioned them as being the, the most uh, well-known ones or the most prominent ones at the moment. So and I think you've probably answered that one already about the, the hero worshipping them. Well, it's probably not quite right. But we've also got a comment from Floyd, and you might like to you might like to address this one in a little more detail. James Aspie advocates well. He discusses with real people about the necessity of going vegan. What's wrong with that? Well, first of all, um, James Aspie advocates. I, I, he certainly doesn't advocate abolitionism. Uh, he does advocate veganism, but he also advocates. Well, actually, I'm not. I'm not sure that that's true because he advocates. He 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 promotes the idea of incremental change, and he also promotes the idea. He promotes a lot of the 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 the, the welfare groups, um, and I mean, I've heard him do that myself. So, I mean, I I think that that's. So I'm not. It's not clear to me. The other two I know less about Car uh, Carb Strong and Earthlings and whatnot, but uh, uh, Ed, Ed Earthling. Um, I know less about them, although we've had people who come to the page and claim to be uh, 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 devotees of these people who don't know what they're talking about. Um, so I, I don't really know how how you know clear what they're doing is, and I'm not even sure what they are doing. Uh, but well, but, know, but I, why why do we need them? Right, I mean, why right. why do we need them? When they, you, know. when you spoke about this, I, I've actually not heard any of them ever say a word, not one of those three people say a word, because I've never looked at any of the things that are on YouTube or whatever. But if someone is out there giving a vegan message, good for them. Right. Um, but they're doing it. Why are we not doing it? Why are you not doing it? That's great. But we don't need to have anyone raised up as the person speaking for us. Their, their reach is limited. Um, uh, setting someone up to do the job for you, as we were speaking before, and Gary was was explaining, um, has serious pitfalls, and it doesn't have a good history. The, the history of of, of uh, designating people as mouthpieces and heroes is not good. Um, but we need to get away from that. We we if those people want to go out and do advocacy, great. I hope they're doing good advocacy. But we all need to be going out there and doing good advocacy. So. 
Um, I, I'm not familiar with those people. I'm sure they're not interested in anything I have to say about them, but I don't need to know anything about them. And no one participating today does either. Go out, get yourself ready to talk to people and do it. Commit they're, to doing it. They're not doing anything that you, you know, that you all, yeah. you know, can't do. Um, so just go out and do it. Educate yourself. Educate yourself in my judgment, sort of better than perhaps some of these folks have, but educate yourself more clearly about an abolitionist vegan message. Stay away from the single issue campaign. Stay away from promoting the large organizations. Get out there and talk about veganism and why veganism is important. And, and you know, that's what you should be doing. And so, you know, I agree with Anna. You know, anybody who advocates for veganism in a clear way, anybody who advocates for abolitionism, that's great. But there's no need, you know, over the years, we have been asked many times, people have said, look, you know, we'll, we'll, why don't you start an organization? Why don't you become leaders and do this and do that? And the answer is not interested. You know, you've got to be, if we're going to change this, you have to become a leader. Each, each one, each person has to be a leader and get out there and do things, you know, and, and yeah, I mean, I've worked really hard and Anna's worked really hard over the years to, to try to generate the theory. And there's been a lot of confusion. I mean, you know, most people don't re recognize that before, you know, the late 80s, early 90s, there was really no discussion about the rights welfare uh, uh, matter. There, I mean, there was no really clear thinking about it. And the movement was drifting. Right back, we started off with the rights movement in the 1980s, in the 1970s in Britain, in the 1980s in the United States. And then it just drifted right back to a welfare model. And that was the whole point of the book that I wrote in the mid-90s, Rain Without Thunder, was to say, look, we're, we're going right back to a welfare model. And so, you know, yeah, I mean, people can, you know, we all need to be thinking about these things. But the bottom line is the idea that we sort of have these people show up who, from what I can see, and I, I don't know much about these folks, uh, they've got, they're, they're confused. They're, they're, fair, they're, they're pretty confused. Um, and, 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 but they're not saying anything original. They're not saying anything new. And they want people to give them support to support them so they can go say it. And the answer is, why are we doing that? I mean, that's never going to work. You're never going to have social change that's going to come about as a result of that sort of model. This sort of social change, which is the most, cha I mean, we are talking about a form of exploitation and, uh, th that is mind boggling in terms of its, its extent. We're killing more animals every year than the number of human beings who have existed on the planet throughout history, throughout human history. Every single year, we're killing more animals. So, I mean, animal exploitation is pervasive. It's part of the, 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 the air that we breathe. Um, we need to change that. The only way we're going to change that is by educating ourselves and getting out there and educating people. And each of us has to become a leader. Each of us has to get out there and educate people. This idea that you know, we're going to sit and write a check or, 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 or contribute to the Patreon account of one of these people or one or more of these people, and that that's going to change things is complete nonsense. And what it's really doing is taking responsibility from us. We are responsible. We've got to do it. And the idea that, well, you know, we're going to, we're going to give money to somebody else to do it is ridiculous. Okay, thanks. Um, I'll, uh, I'll get related to this. Um, Question from Bridget, who says, "What about animal rights marches? Uh, do they have a place?" Well, you know, the problem is, what do we mean by animal rights? You know, I just was reading an article uh, on a website that I've actually written for, uh, and some lawyer was talking about animal rights lawyers. Well, you know, animal rights. I mean, Anna and I ran a clinic for ten years um, at Rutgers. And I, I don't know that, you know, I mean, animal rights, animals are property. We can't really meaningfully talk about them having rights. And, and so this idea that, well, you know, um, uh, 
Animal rights march, Bridget. What is an animal rights march? If it's out, if you're out there and you're talking about abolishing animal exploitation and veganism, I think you know a march or a demonstration. If the message is clear and it's uncluttered, and 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 the what you're promoting is veganism, and it's veganism as a moral imperative, and you're not promoting welfare, and you're not promoting single issue campaigns, and you're promoting a very very clear abolitionist message, I you know I, I don't have a problem with that. I think it's sort of hard to do that in a march context. Um, I think it's, I think it's difficult for a variety of reasons to do that, but I don't have a principled objection to it. The problem I have is that these so-called animal rights marches are not about animal rights. I mean, you know, they're about people promoting Meatless Monday and the people promoting this group and that, oh, this welfare group or that welfare group. So it's not about animal rights at all. I mean, if it were, if you know, if most of the time when you have these marches, you know, uh, uh, the marches to close down slaughterhouses. What, the, what does that mean, the marches to close down? Slaughterhouses aren't the problem. The problem are the people who make the demands, you know, for the products of the slaughterhouses. So the problem isn't the slaughterhouse. The problem is the demand of the consumers, which keeps the slaughterhouses open. That's the problem. So, you know, a march against slaughterhouses or, you know, frequently uh, I get invited to participate in events where we're promoting vegetarianism and veganism. And the answer is I don't promote vegetarianism. Vegetarianism is not veganism. Vegetarianism is animal exploitation. It's just a particular sort of animal exploitation. And I would not participate in a march in which we were promoting eating only meat from large cows, but not small cows. I wouldn't participate in that. I wouldn't, I'm not going to participate in something where, you know, people are, are drawing some artificial line between meat and other animal products. I'm not going to do that either. And so, I mean... It, I think it also has to be an adjunct to other things. Um, by definition, if it's a march, you're walking past people, so you're not really engaging them apart from your banner. And that's a hard... It's not really a good way of engaging people. If you've got a lively social discussion about something, then a march can remind people there are a lot of us who are interested in this issue. Um, just uh, we're doing this on, on the Saturday afternoon. There was another school shooting in the United States yesterday with 10 people killed. Um, lo last time when there was uh, the Florida massacre in February, there, there were quickly organized very large marches. and But that happened in the context of a lively social discussion, an ongoing social discussion about uh, can this gun violence be addressed by legislation? And it was a wake up call to some legislators. There are a lot of us out there who are interested in this issue. But if we haven't done the groundwork so that people understand what we're even talking about, and if there isn't a core of people, an important mass of people who are um, already to be reckoned with in terms of, of, of government or, or whoever else we're talking to, then I think marches are not particularly effective. I think we need to do the important groundwork first so that the marches are not, again, just um, you know either an opportunity to, to vent and uh, feel you're doing something and uh, uh, release some emotions and stuff. Um, Sometimes it uh, takes on a little bit of the entertainment aspect yeah. too. Um, you, your your um, a curiosity for the people um, that you're marching by, and it's an opportunity for people to feel some much needed solidarity if they are vegans and feeling isolated or, or whatever. But um, I think it's only really effective as a political um uh, vehicle if more more people are already interested in the issue. I mean, I've, I have no problem in principle with them, but I right. agree with Anna. They, they've got to be an adjunct. That, just a march. I mean, it, when I see adver advertisements for animal rights marches or animal liberation marches, they invariably don't have, they're not promoting veganism as a moral imperative. They're not promoting the abolition of all animal exploitation. If they were, I would uh, at least not have a principled objection to them. But they're, but as Anna says, they're more about the you know entertainment and solidarity for the people who are participating in them. Because right now we live in a society where people are focused. The animal welfare groups, the large animal 
corporate animal charities have done a magnificent job of focusing people's attention on the treatment of animals, that we have to treat animals better. You know, I mean, think about it. The, the primary focus right now of mainstream animal groups is focusing on aspects of factory farming. Well, you know, it doesn't really matter how they're farmed. The fact is they're farmed. They're going to end up dead anyway, however they're farmed. Um, and so, but we're foc- we focus people on treatment. And, you know, so, so that now I understand why these groups do this, because it sort of makes their donor base very broad, because, you know, they can get a lot of people to agree in some way with that message while they continue to eat, wear and use animals. I understand what they're doing. But those groups have done a very good job of focusing people's attention on the wrong issue. And so we don't really have a social context right now where people can even hear the message. I mean, they need to be introduced to the message and they need to be educated about the message. And I have no principled objection to an abolitionist vegan march. I haven't seen any. I mean, all of these events I've seen are vegetarian slash veganism or they're promoting meatless Mondays or, you know, these other sorts of things. Um, And they all involve these groups that are promoting happy exploitation that are working with companies like Whole Foods to, you know, uh, 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 promote, uh, you know, uh, supposedly humanely, more humanely uh, made animal products. So, I mean, I, I've not seen the, you know, I've not seen one of these things. I don't have a principled objection, but I haven't seen one yet. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, so, uh, slight divergence, but there is an element of um, following along the theme. I think, to a certain extent, all the all the organisations and individuals that we've been been talking about, they do promote veganism to to a greater or lesser extent. Not abolitionist veganism, but they promote veganism. So a question from Banny, who says, do you think it matters how people get to veganism? Um, I see the logic of the abolitionist approach, but haven't been able to persuade my vegan sister-in-law that it should replace other efforts to persuade people to go vegan. I see lots of problems with other campaigns, but I would welcome input on how to counter the argument that if these movements are creating more vegans, then they are useful allies. I've been vegan for over 20 years, and used to be the only vegan per- person I knew. I used to be the only vegan people knew. Sorry, got it. The only vegan people knew. Uh, now I'm one of at least a few. So it's hard to make the case that things aren't changing. Would your take on this be that it's changing too slowly? So I guess there's two questions there. Um, do you think it matters how people get to veganism? And do you think things are changing too slowly? Well, yeah, I think things are changing too slowly, for sure. Do I think how it matters? Yeah, I think. I, I mean, look, um, one of the things that, that we get a lot of feedback on is from people who have been vegetarians for a long time and have been involved in the animal movement, but no one's ever explained to them why they need to go vegan because these groups don't promote veganism. And to the extent that, you know, um, what is this person's name? Uh, She's uh, Banny. Banny. B-A-N-I. All of these groups, Banny, um, all of them, promote veganism as one way of reducing suffering. So, you know, they're promoting cage-free eggs, crate-free pork, veganuary, you know, meatless Monday, and they'll promote veganism as one of the options. Um, I think that's fundamentally problematic. I think we should be, you know, in, in the same way that I think it'd be fundamentally problematic if you said, well, you know, slavery is a problem. So, you know, Abolition is one response, but equally plausible and equally acceptable responses are more humane slavery or, you know, uh, not not breaking up slave families to the extent that we do or things like that. You know, there are different ways of of, of dealing with the slavery situation. I, I think we would see the problem with that immediately. Um, and so I, I think that um, I think that. We ought to be clear that as a as a matter of justice, we have an obligation to stop eating them, wearing them, using them, treating them as replaceable resources in any way whatsoever. 
it is my view that we would, if we had been promoting, think about this for a second. If all the people who care about animals were promoting veganism for the past 30 years, and veganism is a very, very clear message, we'd have many, 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 many more vegans now. And so the fact that some people get to veganism after going through many other stages doesn't mean we have to, it doesn't mean as a, as a practical matter that we need to promote those things. And as a moral matter, we ought not to be promoting those things. So, you know, the fact that, um, that someone goes through various stages, somebody says, well, you know, yeah, I'm a vegan, but I went vegan very, very slowly. And, and, you know, I, I, it was over a period of 10 years. But I'm a vegan. So what difference does it make? And the answer is, well, let's, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're vegan. But ought we be promoting, because it took you 10 years, should we say be saying to people, well, you know, here's uh, the 10-year plan. <laughs> ten, plan, you know, take your time because, it, you know, it took me time. And the answer is, no, I don't think we should be doing that. But I also think that we're assuming that just because people – took the wrong position and eventually got to veganism, they wouldn't have gotten to veganism more quickly if they had been introduced to the right ideas. And I think that that's, you know, that, 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 that's something we encounter every single day. People say, you know, I was a vegetarian for 20 years. No one ever discussed veganism with me as a moral imperative. Yeah, I knew that I could be a vegan, but I never, I thought I was doing good by being a vegetarian. I never realized I was engaging in animal exploitation. I never thought of it that way. And I've been in, got involved in this organization and that organization. No one's ever told me that. I mean, many know? of us stumble on what we think of, come to think of the right ideas in completely fortuitous ways. Some of us even come to those realizations as a result of very bad experiences. But it doesn't mean that we have to replicate that path, that bad experience, um, as the optimal way of educating. I mean, otherwise, um, you know, I, I, I hear that some of the people who engage in these save um, uh, events that we, were, we talked about at the beginning uh, are not even vegan. Or perhaps that experience has, has made them vegan. Well, are we supposed to keep um, sending animals to slaughter so that we can have that encounter and the penny can drop. I don't think so. So the fact that um, we may have taken our time to come to the right decision um, or we had a circuitous route or we had an odd encounter or something doesn't mean that we shouldn't frame our education in the way that's most likely to get the most people to the right abolitionist views as quickly as possible. So if we all do our homework and become good individual abolition vegan educators, then that's we're most likely targeting the right result that way. Um, you know, we all, many of us have our own stories about how we developed our, our ideas, how we came to different um, understandings of the issue, but we don't have to replicate that. That's not how you decide plan to educate um if we all got together everyone participating today and wrote down how you know why and how did i come vegan become vegan there might be a, a there would be a great variety of of paths um that got us to that point um but it doesn't mean that that's how you plan your vegan advocacy and also i, I would you know i also think it's important that a lot of people assume that we've got a lot, you know, we have more vegans now because of these groups. So they say, well, you know, you can criticize these groups, but we have more vegans now as a result of these groups. And the answer is, who says? I mean, why does anybody think that we have more vegans as a result of these groups? Maybe maybe we'd have even more if we didn't have these groups giving them the wrong message. Right. I mean, we hadn't ceded the subject to the big groups and right. let them ch choose what was the way that brought the most revenue into their corporations. If we didn't stand back and let um, these personalities emerge and say, you know, let them go out and do it on our behalf, um, where would we be? We don't know. We haven't really had a widespread mass push 
uh, of committed abolitionist vegans Absolutely. going out there and doing the education. And that's why we wanted to talk to you today. And that's why we want to take your questions. And that's why we want to hear what you think is effective. Because I think it's likely that a good, strong, consistent grassroots approach will be much more effective, much more quickly than what we've seen the experience of so far. Let's try it. I mean, one of the reasons why I think there's been a greater interest in veganism is it's no longer the case that the large groups have strangleholds on the dissemination, dissemination of information. Right. And now we have this thing called the internet. We're doing a webinar on the internet right now. Well, that, those are, that, that didn't exist, you know, a short time ago. The technology didn't exist to do that. And so, you know, we now have the internet and people have access to information and they're educating themselves. Um, and, and, you know, we're seeing some changes. I think we could see more changes if we didn't have the noise all the time of the large groups and the celebrities and the personalities telling us, oh, well, you know, you can't really make moral judgment. I agree. We shouldn't be making moral judgments about individuals, but I think we do need to make moral judgments about animal exploitation. And if we had sort of a you know, clearer thinking, I think that we would be, we would be moving much faster than we're moving now. And um, so, anyway. Well, this, this brings us to a, a, another question, actually. Coincidentally, uh, this, this one's from Anna, who says, Gary, what do you fancy for dinner tonight? Oh, no, hang on. It's not the wrong question. Hang on. Uh, this is one's from Anna. She says, are there any quality studies on the effectiveness of vegan animal rights activism? If not, why not? I couldn't find any. Only two old bad design interview questionnaire works with no clear results. Yeah, there, there's a real problem with um, with empirical research um, for a variety of reasons. It's expect. I mean, there are studies that are uh, you know there are these groups that 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 claim to be. Um, coming up with empirical studies, but these are groups that are basically doing, these are groups funded by welfareist organizations that are coming up with um, silliness uh, to support animal welfare reform. And, you know, so they've got an organization that sort of gives, um, you know, it rates the various charities and, you know, they rate the charities that are based, that basically support them. Uh, and they pr produce, um, supposedly empirical information and evidence that what they're doing is the right thing and whatnot. But, you know, um, you don't need to be a statistician to see that that is um, just garbage. Um, you know, the, the, the empirical world, the stuff that I've seen is, is silly beyond belief. Uh, it's the sort of thing that you, you would not, um, if, if, a, if, a, if a, an in, a student taking an introductory course in uh, uh you know, statistical analysis or, 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 or study, you know, doing one of these studies design, you would call the student in and try to help the person uh, do work that went beyond the level of a D grade of D. That's uh, really horrible stuff. And these organizations that, that purport to be empirical basically are nothing but PR. They're, they're, they're doing nothing but producing public, they're, they're public relations groups for the large organizations. And, um, you know, they're being funded by those large organizations and they're promoting the, um, the, 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 the uh, agendas of these large organizations. And if anyone hasn't noticed so far, perhaps we should just repeat it. Um, we're not going to be the people who are going to tell you that charities and, and corporate approaches are the way to go. So um, we have the long history to look at of the various organizations and the ways that they've approached it and we ha and we have not come far enough so what we have proposed is that everyone undertake the responsibility of being individual educators um, it's not that we just haven't got the right way for charities to operate I'm interested in this and uh, this moment in the me too movement and there have been some horror stories of uh, what it's like to work in some of these organizations well surprise surprise they're like every other large corporation and they need to be cleaned out, but they don't need to be replaced. They will not get better. They may get different, but they will not get much better as 
advocacy organizations to really make social change if you just stick a woman at the head of them. You know, if a woman's taken over the Humane Society of the United States, it's going to be essentially the same organization with perhaps a few fewer problems um, in terms of, you know, human resources um, issues for the corporation. Um, it's, it's, we need to change the model. So ranking how various corporate charities are doing is not, um, I would think, the way to go to find out what's effective. Also, let, let me just say about the, the premise of the need for empirical research. Do we ask for whether or not there are studies that show whether or not we would get to um, a rejection of racism faster if we promoted gentle racism. I mean, nobody ever says, well, you know, maybe taking a hard line equality view is just turning people off. So maybe we ought to take a less hard line view about equality. And maybe, you know, we ought to, you know, we ought to go easy on this and not be hard, you know, not, not be, uh, uh, purist. Yeah. Yeah. Pure, purist. <laughs> not be purist about, about ra about racial equality or or sexual equality or whatever, and, and we just sort of soft pedal it because, you know, we need people aren't ready for that people aren't it. ready for it, and we need studies that show that you know that taking a hard line of you know equality approach is a good idea. Most people would say, "What are you talking about? We have a moral obligation to reject racism, and we don't need a study." that says, well, you know, if you have racist joke-free Monday, maybe it will lead uh, in a faster way to the rejection of racism. We don't, we don't think that way. Where it comes to the fundamental rights of humans, we're not asking for empirical studies that demonstrate that the position that we think we ought to be taking is the right position. It's only when we come to to the animal question. And people say, well, you know, you're promoting it. We stop, you know, exploiting animals, but maybe we need an empirical study because, you know, and I hear, I, you know, I have actually been involved in discussions with animal advocates. I, I went um, to the 2013 so-called animal rights uh, national conference. Um, it was a national conference. It had nothing to do with animal rights, however, um, that uh, the uh, that Alex Hershaft and the farm animal uh, rights movement puts on every year. And um, and I actually heard people, you know, sitting around having discussions. Well, you know, maybe we, you know, studies show that if we if we aren't taking um, uh, you know, a hardline approach, people will go vegan faster. And I, you know, and I asked them for what, what studies they were talking about and they didn't know the reason being that there are no such things, but, um, but why are we even asking about, I mean, we either think animal exploitation is right or wrong. If we think it's wrong, we ought to be clear it's wrong. We don't need empirical studies that tell us that we ought to not say it's wrong if we think it's wrong because people will come to the conclusion it's wrong if we tell them it's not wrong. In addition to it being counterintuitive, it's morally objectionable. Okay, thank you. Um, we're talking about organizations. Here's a very quick question from Lewis and Torres. Uh, this is an interesting one. Are you against organizations, even if they're abolitionist? <laughs> there are no abolitionist organizations. Um, <laughs> I wish I'd had $10 on that answer. Yeah, I mean, there are none. I think we would have started one if we thought that was the way to go. People always said, why didn't you, you know, start a, incorporate and start one? And we've always resisted as a matter of principle. Um, because uh, we, we didn't want to go down the same path that um, a lot of other people have gone down. And that, that was a deliberate decision, and it's a continuing decision. So I suppose that's the answer. Um, we want to turn the mirror to every individual participating today and everyone else who might be interested in this issue. Um, to really focus on everyone's individual responsibility as educators to get this word out. Absolutely. 
So that's what I will say, <laughs> keep saying. Um, uh, very resistant to the idea of, of institutionalizing this. I think it's completely counterproductive. Having said that, having said that, I'm not aware of any abolitionist right. organizations. None, not one. Okay, thanks. Um, a question from Conju. Here in New York City this weekend is the NYC Veg Fest. Unfortunately, invited to speak to this event are the likes of Brian Cateman to promote reducitarianism. Please discuss how ridiculous it is to associate with this idea to the ethical vegan abolitionist movement. I'm assuming yeah. he thinks that, uh, or Conju <laughs> thinks that. You've answered your own question. Your own question. Bri Bri uh, Brian uh, Cateman is not a vegan. Right. He's coming to talk to people about why um, we don't have to be vegans and why, um, you he's know. He's a professional non-vegan. Exactly, so he, exactly. He's, he's, he's doing something else. Right, right. He's, he's a professional non-vegan. I'm sure that New York City will provide much better entertainment than that this weekend. Go and find something good um, that gives something back to you and uh, uh, as, celebra as um, edu uh, entertainment in New York City. Indeed, this indeed, indeed. <laughs> actually, actually, what I think about New York City is just a marvelous place. Um, it's an absolutely marvelous place. And the idea that anybody would take any time while they're in Manhattan to go listen to Brian Cayman talk about reducitarianism um, mm. is sad. It's very sad. It's very sad. Very sad. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know anything about the, the NYC Veg Fest. I mean, do you know anything about it? I mean, is it, is it anything more than a, you know, a, a pie-eating couple of days or, you know, vegan oh, produce and... You know, if, if he's going to be their speaker, there's no... There's well, no obviously, it's not a vegan event. There's, there's no <laughs> principle framework. So, hey, there's, there's a lot of good vegan restaurants in New York City. I think you'd spend your time and money much better than having a good dinner in one of them. Yeah, exactly. exactly. You know, Perhaps you want to do something activist. Take some of your non-vegan friends to one of the many really excellent vegan restaurants in, in Manhattan and so that they can see that, you know, we vegans don't eat styrofoam and and you know all sorts of parts. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps uh, perhaps, Cayman, perhaps and, Cayman will be um, uh, go to one of those places uh and why i don't understand why anybody <laughs> listen to brian Cayman for any <laughs> period of time perhaps he's going to be telling people they should reduce their pie intake or something like that during the veg fest huh? well you know the you know the, the thing is i hope the veg fests I hope the vegan, I veg, I mean, a lot of the, I, I'm not, I don't, veg fest is, a, is an ambiguous word because some of these, some of these veg fests um, don't have, uh, uh, they're not exclusively vegan. But um, even the ones that are uh, uh, exclusively vegan, I hope that they will evolve um, to try to sort of promote uh, healthier eating. Uh, as well, I mean, the, the veg. The, the, these events tend to be places where, um, if you don't eat stuff with a lot of salt and oil and and you know fried stuff and whatnot, um, you're going to be hard pressed to find something to eat. Um, and and vegan food is really uh, absolutely so. It's it's what vegan food is wonderful. And um, one of the things we've done over the years is we've moved away from we used to eat a lot of fried stuff and we used to eat you know uh, we've been vegans for over three decades now almost four but um but you know we were not you know we used to eat a lot of vegan food that was not particularly healthy and we've moved away from that and we stay away from oil now we don't fry anything as a matter of fact um francis mccormick your the other half of the grumpy vegans introduced us to an air fryer uh, and I actually have to say that the air fryer is the most compelling evidence I have that God does exist. Um, <laughs> it's an absolutely marvelous, marvelous thing. Uh, and um, we are now having air fried French fries, <laughs> no oil. Um, and and um, I guess as an American, I should call them freedom fries because France did not come with us to invade Iraq and they're bad <laughs> Uh, and so, um, although I guess we like them better, and we, we like them more now, but um, but we are finally having French, which I, I have not had French fries for years because I don't eat fried stuff anymore. And you can get an air fryer, and I got it off of eBay, cost virtually nothing, and and um, we are now eating 
lots of French fries um, <laughs> because they don't have they don't have any oil, and, you, and we don't make them with salt. And so, um, uh, but I hope that these, you know, part of what's going on right now is this idea that we've got to tell people that they're not going to be sacrificing anything if they go vegan. And so they'll still be able to eat fake meat, you know, they'll still, still be able to eat like sausage or meatballs or, you know, things that, you know, that are made with. So, and I don't have a moral objection to that, although I, well, I don't have a moral objection per se to that. Um, but I think, you know, part of it sort of reinforces this idea that food is either animal stuff or stuff that mimics animal stuff. And, and, you know, I don't look, I obviously rather have people eating soy, you know, sausage rather than real sausage, obviously. Um, but I, I think that, you know, um, we need to sort of get away from the idea that if we don't have something which pretends to be a dead animal on our plate, whether it is in fact a dead animal or a phony dead animal, that we've got to have a dead animal sort of thing on the plate. Um, I think we need to get away from that. You know, this idea that we're deprived if we don't have, you know, it, it's sort of like the tofurkey phenomenon that, you know, we celebrate Thanksgiving and we celebrate Thanksgiving traditionally by, celebrating it over some poor dead bird you know so we give thanks for what we have by killing some bird which is sort of absurd in the first place but those of us who are vegan i say well you know we don't have to do that because we can celebrate thanksgiving and we don't have to give up anything we can have the tofurkey well obviously i'd rather have people eating tofurkey than not eating tofurkey frankly i find it disgusting i mean i the, the idea that people you know i mean i i the last time i ate tofurkey uh was was many years ago Someone gave me a piece and it had, it had soy skin, you know, it had like a, like a wrapper, you know, and it was, it was crispy and it was meant to mimic turkey skin. And it did taste like turkey skin and it made me want to vomit, frankly. I mean, but if people want to eat that stuff, I mean, it's not a more, it's not, well, it, it, it it's not, uh, I certainly think it's better than eating uh, real turkey, but I think this idea that, you know, we've got to have, a, a mim we've got to have something that mimics the dead bird in order to have the meal be significant, I think is something we need to get away from. But I also recognize that, um, you know, that's a few steps ahead. And um, for now, I'd rather have people eating tofurkey, obviously, than eating real turkey. And if that's yeah, what they want to encourage people to go to sites like how yeah. do I go vegan? Yeah, I mean, we, we, where there's cheap. Um, accessible, fast, you know, quickly prepared food that's appetizing and interesting and varied. So they'll see that there's indeed no deprivation to from a vegan diet. So yeah, I mean, I mean, part part of the problem is also you know this stuff, the the these uh, analogs, they're expensive, right? You know, in addition to having tons of salt, no nutritive value, lots of fat, um, you know, you know, in terms of the oil. Um, they they're expensive and sort of reinforces this idea to be a vegan. You've got to be, you know, you've got to have a lot of money and you've got to spend a lot of money on food. And the answer is no, you don't. I mean, the, one of the things that um, we've been work, you know, working with um, once again, to mention, it's not that we don't like you. It's just, we're mentioning Francis <laughs> again. Um, uh, and, and uh, uh, one of the things that Francis, I think has done a hell of a job doing is developing uh, these recipes where, you know, she can figure out how to feed a family of, you know, 50,000, um, you know, on a budget of, you know, $10. And it's, I, I mean, some of the recipes she comes up with are fabulous. They cost nothing. They're high in nutrition, you know, and they're, you know, so they're good for you and they cost very little. And that's what I want to sort of reinforce is that people can be vegans. They don't have to buy all this expensive stuff. As a matter of fact, the stuff that's really good and good for you is really cheap. Well, I'll, I'll let you into something that won't be anything anything like a secret. I've eaten virtually every one of them. <laughs> I'm sure you have, you have the advantage of and I, can get, I, can, I can confirm they really are nice. <laughs> okay, um, and a slightly different subject. You you mentioned um, you mentioned earlier that um, it'd be a, be a good idea if advocates um, educate themselves um, if they want to advocate animal rights. I think there's a general misconception that if you if you advocate veganism, you're automatically advocating animal rights, which, as you know, and as you've already said, is quite true. Um, so we've got a question from Sandy who um, who says, um, "What books would you recommend to start if you wish to educate yourself?" 
Well, I mean, the three books that we wrote, we wrote to educate people to, so that they could educate people about veganism. I mean, they're they're working books. They're not they're not theory books. They they're not primarily theory books. They're books to to educate people to educate about veganism. Um, and and um, so we want them to be like a hand right, you know, handbooks like Eat Like You Care, basically deals with the major. Uh, reasons why people don't go vegan. You know, it's a matter of tradition or, you know, doesn't God want us to eat? I mean, they're sort of dealing with the standard stuff that you get when you talk about veganism. Um, and then Animal Rights, the Abolitionist Approach explains, takes the theory of animal rights and tries to make it really accessible and gives lots of examples so that people can try to, you know, understand the theory of what animal rights means in practice. And then um, uh, Advocate for Animals is a book that deals with um, how we can, it, it, well, the various ways in which we can be effective vegan educators. And we did these things, we did these books as, as handbooks. Um, we keep them cheap so that people have access to them. We distribute lots of copies that, you know, that we, um, you know, we, we try to, we try to get them into people's hands. Um, and, um, and so, these are, but these are, you know, these are sort of handbooks, and um, and that's what we would recommend. I mean, these are abolitionist handbooks. So, you know, if you read Animal Rights: The Abolitionist Approach, it's basically, um, uh, it, it takes the thirty some odd years work that I've been doing on animal rights theory and the theory of animals as property and things like that, and condenses it into a fairly. Uh, and I think it's, I, I, I mean, I, you know, uh, obviously it could be more complicated and I could have gotten more into the philosophical stuff, but the bottom line is you don't have to. I mean, it's like, it, it, if you read that book, you'll understand what you need to understand to be an effective animal rights advocate. Um, if you read Eat Like You Care and Advocate for Animals, you'll understand how to talk to people about veganism and why you should talk with them in certain ways and not talk with them in certain in other ways, you know, why, why you should approach the subject in certain ways and not approach it in other ways. So, you know, I think, I think those are the, those are the books out there. That's the, we also have, how do I go vegan.com, which is, uh, I think a really good site that we did. We did that as a collective matter. A bunch of us got together, you being one of the people. Um, and, and, you know, a bunch of us got together and we designed a website and, um, and I think it's a very effective advocacy tool. Abolitionistapproach.com has lots of essays and people can go and read all sorts of various things about, about various campaigns that I have commented on and, um, and, and things that Anna and I have written. Um, and so there's lots of stuff out there uh, that, you know, that people can read. Get out there and read it, you know. I mean. Okay, thanks for that. I um, hope that's okay, Sandy. Perhaps you'll let us know in the, um, in the chat room if um, you're happy with that. Okay, a couple of general sort of advocacy questions. Oh, no, I couldn't say that. Advocacy questions. From Suzanne, firstly, she says, how do you speak with someone who acknowledges animals are morally relevant but are fearful of letting go what they know? I find some people have acknowledged they must stop eating, wearing, using animals, but it's been part of their identity for so long they fear the change even though they want it. Well, you know, it's like all, it's like all things – that we haven't really questioned that have been a part of our lives. And then all of a sudden somebody comes up and says, you know, this is a problem and you agree with it. I mean, I think we have to um, encourage people to have some level of moral courage. And, um, you know, we can, we all have stories that we can tell them, at least most of us do about how eating animals was an important part of our lives um, uh, until it stopped uh, being a part of our lives. And, um, and so, you know, we can empathize with them and say, yeah, you know, we understand it's scary in much the same way that my guess is it was really terrifying. If you were a person in Mississippi in 1962 and you had people talking about civil rights and you knew that that was the right thing to do, you knew that the racism that infected and continues to infect this country was problematic. Do you stand up and say, you know, yeah, it's wrong. And it's a sort of a matter, you know, part of being human is uh, engaging that, that moment when 
you've got to you, you come to to you come to confront something a more some moral reality that requires that you change, and then you have to decide who you are, and that's an important moment. And we've all gone through it, and you know we've all gone through it with animals and with other issues, you know where we've had that moral moment where we had a moral recognition and it it conflicts with our behavior up to that point or our beliefs up to that point. Then the question is, all right, what are you going to do about it? And, you know, one of the things I, and because I deal with this a fair amount, I think Anna does as well, you know, where people say, you know, you're right, but I'm terrified. And so, you know, I mean, neither of us is a psychologist and, and, um, uh, but, you know, we try to engage people. What, what terrifies you about it? Why are you, you know, well, it's been a part of my life. Well, you know, but lots of bad things are parts of our lives. Once we confront the fact that they're, you know, once we accept that they're bad things, then we just have to stop. Them. And, and, and then we have to decide who we are as a moral matter. And, and, um, and, and, and you know, I, I have in the past, and I do, you know, I, I, I did it actually not long ago, had a conversation with somebody who I gave a lecture and some young person came up to me and said, I, you're right, I want to do it, um, but I'm terrified. I said, what are you terrified of? Well, you know, it's such a change for me. I said, all things which are important and which make your life actually, which actually end up making you a better person are traumatic. And, um, and that's also one of the instances where it can be particularly helpful um, if you've encountered, you've had this discussion with someone as part of your individual abolitionist outreach, because we really need to unpack what are people are frightened of. Yeah. Um, Gary's discussed um, before um, the fact that quite a lot of people actually think that there's a there's a health risk to going vegan i mean there's resources and uh, your own example will reassure them on that um people are a little bit at sea as to okay i i if i if the penny drops today and i actually decide to go vegan what do i eat tonight and that's why it's so helpful to have the website of how do i go vegan it tells people what they can choose to eat tonight out of the things that they probably already have in their cupboards and it won't take three hours and they won't have to start grinding their own flour and everything and spending, you know, eight hours a day chopping vegetables and doing everything from scratch. But also, if you're if you're having encounters um, and discussions with people, they have you as the model. You are, uh, you know, an, a, a functioning um, person who's integrated abolitionist veganism into their everyday normal in the best sense of the word life so you haven't become a person set apart who can't do all sorts of things and is a pariah and and you know has to pack pack food with them and take it everywhere and is is somehow compromised or or are restricted in some way by that decision you can you can express the good things about that decision with a bit of help maybe you need to take someone shopping uh, maybe you need to invite them over for dinner or maybe you give them that suggestion of what they're going to eat today and how they're going to deal with their kids' school lunches and things like that. Um, really practical things. Just a lot of people are ready if you would just give them that good moral push with a bit of uh, practical support. So there's nothing wrong with really giving the simple practical support. That's terribly important. And no, you're not you're not giving the big speech and and um, setting up the Patreon page to do something, but you're actually helping someone to follow through on what they are ready to do, what they're primed to do. So, um, is there anything more important? I can't think of anything more important to be helpful, um, supportive, so that people feel that they can they can ask the question that they're worried is a silly question. You can tell people. I've been there. I've done that. You know, um, the, 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 how do I go vegan dot com page allows you to ask questions and, you know, you can get mentoring help and whatnot. I think it's really important. And again, this is a problem that's been 
uh, exacerbated by a lot of the large corporate animal groups of making veganism seem really difficult. Exactly. You know, and I think we've just got to explain to people it's not difficult at all. I mean, I never. I always tell people, look, you eat fruits, yeah. You eat vegetables, yeah. You eat grains, yeah. You eat beans, yeah. You eat nuts and stuff. Oh yeah, I love all that stuff. Good. Eat more of that stuff and cut out everything else. Boom, you're vegan. It's easy. And as far as you say, what about nutrition? Well, what about nutrition? You're eating decomposing flesh, cow mucus, chicken ova. There's some interest in nutrition. And, and all of a sudden, like you're worried that you're going to like be, you know, nutritionally deficient because you're not eating all that garbage. And, and um, you know, the bottom line is you can learn everything you need. I mean, no governmental or professional health organization says that you need to eat animal products for optimal health. You don't. You, ha have, you can't eat iceberg lettuce, obviously. But if you eat a sensible vegan diet, you're going to be fine. I think, I'm not a doctor, but my view is you will be healthier. You certainly won't be less healthy. If you eat a vegan diet. So I think, you know, it's important to demystify the stuff, to not tell people, oh, well, you know, see the animal groups say, oh, well, it's really hard to be vegan. You don't have to be vegan. You know, you can take you can take baby steps, blah, blah, blah. Um, you don't have to be vegan. And 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 it's difficult. And, you know, that's the gold standard. If you're not but, you ready, know, at least go, you know, you know tree. And, and yeah, exactly. Sort of thing. And, and I think we've got to just stop that nonsense. You know, we've got to say, look, it's easy. You can do it. And if you're a slow reader, you can learn everything you need to know about nutrition in about 20 minutes. It, this is not difficult. It's not difficult. And I have, as I was saying before, you know, I gave a lecture recently at a university. And a kid came up, a student came up to me afterwards and said, um, you know, I really think you're right. I, I want to go vegan, but I'm terrified. What are you terrified of? Well, you know, I've been doing it. You know, I've been eating meat my whole life. What are you, like 19 years old? Don't worry about it. You're fine. And um, and I said to him, I said, look, you know, and I talked to him in a few minutes, and he was obviously agitated. You know, he wanted to do it, but he was very agitated, and he was anxious about it. And I said, look, I'm happy to talk with you further. You should do it. I said, you know, you've acknowledged it's wrong. You know what you're doing is wrong. You said to me, you started off the conversation by saying, I feel horrible about exploiting animals. It's wrong. You're absolutely right. It's wrong. I can't justify it. I want to stop. I said, so you really ought to stop. You've acknowledged it's wrong. You ought to stop. I said, if you can't stop, if you're telling me that, you know, after thinking about this, you just, you can't do it, then try this. Go vegan for breakfast for a week. And see that you don't go blind, your arms and legs don't fall off, everything is fine. And then go vegan for lunch for a week. And then you'll see everything's okay. And then go vegan for dinner for a week. And then, boom, you're vegan. However, I told him, he said, well, maybe I'll try that. I said, fine, if you want to try that. I said, but keep one thing in mind. Started off the conversation with me by saying, what I'm doing is morally wrong. And I got to stop. I want to stop. Everything you put in your mouth, you know, everything, you know, over this, if you do this over the next three or four weeks and you continue eating animal products while you get off of them, I said, I'll be happy that you're off of them in four weeks. But the bottom line is from now till then, you're going to be doing things you acknowledge is morally wrong. I said, so you got a problem with that. And he said, yeah, maybe I should do it, you know, quicker. I don't know what he did. I didn't hear anything more from the student, but, um, but, but, you know, I think we've got to try to sort of take the charge out of it, but I would never, ever tell somebody that it's okay to continue eating animal products as long as they're phasing them out. Um, I, Cause I think it's wrong. And I think we've got to reinforce that, that, you know, that, that if you think it's morally wrong, you stop doing what you think is morally wrong. If you acknowledge it's morally wrong, don't do it. Um, have the courage of your own convictions, you know? Well, it's um, very possible to go vegan overnight, as people like to say. Nobody ever does. Uh, yeah, vegan overnight. <laughs> no, so did we. So did Francis, and uh, lots of people I know did. You, it's, it's this moral thing, as you were saying. If you think it's morally wrong, you just stop doing it. You know, I mean, it's, I think uh, the perception uh, is the perception is when you realize you're engaging in conduct that results in the suffering and death of absolutely vulnerable, sentient beings who value their lives. And the best justification you have is they taste good or you like the way they look when you wear them. It hits you or, you know, I mean, it hits you. 
And you say, well, wait, wait, I can't do that. And, um, and I think that, you know, I, I thought, I mean, we've been vegans. This is our 36th year being vegan. We did it together. Um, and we did it 36 years ago. And I think that, I mean, I, I had never heard, I don't know. I, did, had you ever heard the word vegan before yeah. we went through? I mean, I, I, I didn't even know what a vegan was. And then it was explained to me what a vegan was and why I should become one. And frankly, I had thought up to that point that you would die if you didn't eat animal protein. You know, I mean, literally, if you had none at all, I thought, you know, you would die. Um, and 36 years ago, that was, you know, I mean, we get a lot of propaganda now about that, about health. And we're told, you know, the stuff that we're advertised to eat is, is, is horrible. But 36 years ago, I, I mean, I remember when I went to a doctor, you know, when I went for a physical, the first time after I became vegan, doctors just looked at me and said, you're crazy. You're crazy. You're going to get sick. You're going to, I mean, you know, and, and, and was, he was just, he was just perplexed as to why, I mean, it was like going into a doctor's office and saying, you know, I've decided that I'm going to eat, you know, a diet of thumbtacks and that's all I'm going to eat or nails. Um, you know, and I decided that's how I'm going to get my iron, um, is I'm going to eat nails. Um, you know, the doc, the doctor just reacted in a very, very negative way. And so, um, you know, but I, I thought that, you know, it never occurred to me that we couldn't not eat animal products. Now I have to tell you 36 years later, I didn't do it for health. 36 years later is the best decision I ever made in terms of health. I mean, I did not do it for health. I did it for the health of my spirit, not for the health of my body. But I have to tell you, 36 years later, you know, I don't mind getting old. I feel great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, now, another question from this time from Marina, again, about vegan advocacy. She says, how do you react to people who get aggressive when you're speaking about veganism? About what? When you're speaking about veganism, how do you re react when people get aggressive? Well, I think you can usually gauge, is it someone who's just being um, obnoxious, in which case um, there's no reason to engage with them that, you know, just because you're vegan doesn't mean that you have to accept abusive behavior. So um, I, I would deal with that in the way that any other obnoxious um, conversation came my way. Um, but also be aware that some people some are, yeah. are defensive or if they're acting strangely, um, it may be because you've really hit a nerve. Yeah. I mean, I, over the years, I've had very strange comments um, uh, made to me by people that I know know better and it's because you've touched a nerve so the fact that people are suddenly very concerned about um, plants and are, are willing to have odd conversations with you about don't we know that plants have feelings and therefore there's no difference and so they can eat their steak you know when Otherwise, sensible people start talking like that. You know something's going on. And we you can't be interested in this issue for very long without someone saying to you, don't talk to me about that right now at dinner because you'll put me off my dinner. And it's true because most of us have to talk ourselves out of the recognition of what's on the plate before us. Most of us really don't want to think about sinking our teeth into a dead animal. So we talk, talk, call it something else, we you know, pretty it up, and we really don't want to think of the animal behind it. So if you've, if you've got an otherwise, um, the, you know, a person who is otherwise someone you want to engage with, getting a little aggressive to you, um, it may be an opportunity to at least counter that with, with sowing some seeds that might uh, bear fruit later. You might not get them to the point in that conversation if they're not emotionally ready for it. Um, but it's, it's worth you holding your ground, certainly. But as I said, it doesn't mean that you have to put up with someone who's taunting you. That's very different. Uh, I mean, um, I, I agree with that completely. I mean, the I would say in 80% of the cases where I've been giving lectures on veganism and talking with people about veganism and people get aggressive it's because 
you know, I've hit a nerve and, um, and I oftentimes after the event have very good conversations with those people. And a number of those people have become vegan. Um, the problem with aggressive people is mostly with animal people. I mean, ironically, the, those are the people who get aggressive and nasty um, are the people who, you know, when, if you criticize, if you don't, if you, if you criticize their promotion of happy exploitation, rather than deal with you substantively, they get nasty and they start calling you names. That's, that's fairly common in the animal movement. You cannot challenge the prevailing corporate welfareist happy exploitation paradigm. Uh, people don't have anything substantive to say, so they just get nasty. And, you know, I, I, you know, when they show up on my Facebook page, that's what God created delete buttons for. Bye. Uh, um, and, um, and I don't, you know, I just, I don't deal with those. I mean, I, I actually try to stay away from quote animal people end quote as much as I can. I mean, talk, talking to animal people about veganism, talking to people who are sort of into the corporate welfare head about veganism and about animal rights is a waste of time. Um, and, you know, if they want to discuss it, I'll discuss it. But I stay away. I, I really stay away from those events. Um, and and not, not that I'm invited to a lot of them, but um, but but I stay away from them. Um, and I stay away from those sorts of exchanges with people because animal people who are into the, the, the corporate welfareist mentality or into the celebrity sort of thing, and the, you know what you're talking about, the professional careers thing, and you know, and you and you you would all take issue with that. They they get aggressive, they get nasty, they say horrible things, often defamatory things. One thing you might find helpful, I hope you find it helpful, is that um, we get these questions all the time, um, and we've had lots of these encounters over the years. So when we wrote Advocate for Animals, we actually said, okay, let's set some of these examples down. Yeah. So we actually wrote out scripts of conversations yeah. and showed how we dealt with some of them. And I think um, it may be of assistance for other people um, who are having those sorts of confrontations. Yeah. Like this is one way you could have handled it or, you know, in the future, perhaps this will be a good retort to something that's said in a way that turns the conversation into something constructive where you can move it forwards. So um, I would suggest that um, that might be helpful to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we have a, another question from Tejas who says, do you think, or ask or rather, do you think that video recording our conversations with non-vegans is a good idea? Um, and I think the aforementioned professional activists um, are quite keen on this. Taya says, I see a lot of people doing that and the non-vegans look really uncomfortable. I wonder if it makes our advocacy less impactful. Are you talking about like recording people without getting their permission? I, well, I guess so, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't do that. Uh, what, what is what is the <laughs> what's point? the point? First of all, it's obnoxious. Secondly, what's the point? It's well, you can post it on YouTube. It's all about you, doesn't it? You know. So I mean, it's um, it, that's a whole different world. I think it's completely um, ineffective, and I think it's uh, very questionable. So um, I, I think uh, I, th I think yeah, the, the without videos and examples of conversations. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. Um, I mean, it's I, not, I, I, I mean, I, I really, it's, it's totally obnoxious Who's going to behavior. talk to you if exactly, it's being... Exactly, exactly. It's totally obnoxious behavior. I mean, I realize that, like, you know, some animal people think that, you know, obnoxiousness is perfectly acceptable behavior, but it's not. And, um, you know, I mean, I've seen that happen. And I've had, I've had some of these welfare do that to me. They come up to me and they've got their phones and they'll say, well, you know, what's wrong with the anti-fur campaign? And, you know, and, and, you know, my view is if someone doesn't ask me for permission. It's suspiciously quiet. I'm just going to yeah, check on we're dogs. Yeah, she's going to go check the dogs. Um, <laughs> we have six dogs and they're not making much noise, which has got us concerned. Um, oh, no, I'm hearing the noise. Uh, and, um. You know, and my view is, you know, you're going to record somebody, you ask them for permission. And even if you're not legally obligated, although in some cases you are, um, but even if you're not legally obligated to do it, uh, you ought to do it simply because it's not a really very, it's it's obnoxious. And, well, it's a matter of courtesy, I would have thought. 
but, but what's the point? I don't know. What the hell's the point of it? I mean, well, why I, would you? I think I've seen, I, I mean, I have seen people say that they are educational for other activists. If they see how a professional does it, then they'll learn something from. A professional from, yeah. doesn't go up and record somebody who hasn't given permission, you know, um, uh, uh, you know that ha that hasn't given permission to be recorded, and um, and so you know I don't think you should do that, and I I don't think it educates anybody, and um, what it does do is it educates people about the fact that if vegans are um, you know that you ought to be careful whenever a vegan comes up to talk to you, you got to be careful because they may be recording what you're saying. I mean you know it's 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 totally obnoxious. Yeah. Well, I, I think Anna's going to bring back. We've just adopted a dog. Our sixth dog, because our um, our wonderful Tobias passed away. He had kidney disease and died. And um, uh, we were asked to take a dog that um, uh, no one wanted. Uh, what happens is people breed. Uh, they they take Merle Shelties, gray Shelties, and they breed them with other gray Shelties in an effort to get a white Sheltie because white Shelties bring a lot of money. The problem is that 25%, and they know this, the breeders know this, 25% of the animals that are, that are produced are deaf or blind. Some of them are both deaf and blind. And we have a dog, his name is Finley, and we're gonna introduce him to you. He's a wonderful dog, but he's a real, he's a real example of what's wrong with the world. Um, we got Finley. Is Finley coming? Ah, uh, here comes Finley. Here comes Finley. Here comes Finley. Um, okay, here comes Finley. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna see if Finley. He doesn't. He's not a big fan of being picked up. But say hello. This is Finley. Say hi, Finley. Ah. Oh. Um, this is Finley, and Finley is deaf and almost blind. He has basically no eye in this eye, and this eye has. He's able. They think to see some sh some shadow, but not much. And um, and he often walks into things, and he often walks into our other dogs, <laughs> and um, who are very very understanding. He's a wonderful dog, and he's teaching us an enormous amount. Um, he ha he's a, he's a real sweetheart, and um, you know these are, these dogs are routinely drowned. Um, when the breeders get them, they drown them. And when we got this dog, uh, the someone was fostering him, and um, and and somebody was fostering him, and we got his quote papers, and they came in an envelope from the breeder, and he was described as white dog, white dog, deaf, mostly blind, uh, but runs with the pack, which is true. He will run with the other dogs because he basically follows them follows their scent but he's he's a wonderful little person and it was his birthday yesterday yeah. he was a year old yesterday and um and he's a wonderful dog he's an absolutely wonderful dog but have he to take was care of the ones who are here yeah so yeah he was produced sure everyone on the web webinar is uh you know has adopted or Fostered if they can, but it's uh, an important thing that we all need to do. Yeah. Get down, yeah. Oh, okay. Down. But he's well, a great little dog. You can see two of ours in the picture. I've got, I've got, uh, I've got little Charlie sitting oh. on my lap, as you can see. Yeah. Oh. Oh and yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, sitting, sitting on the back of the sofa is, is in it, who's 18 years old now and still as sprightly as a kitten. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tell you what, I wish I was as sprightly as a kitten myself. But there you go. <laughs> We cannot, we he's a wonderful. Try. He's wonderful, but you know, none of them should exist in the first place. Yeah, and the idea that somebody bred um, this dog that this is this knowing is, knowing that there was a chance that this could happen, and they did it anyway because they wanted to make a few bucks. Um, and then I have to listen to people tell me that well, the problem that you know the an animals as property is not a problem, you know, because we could always. You know, we can always deal with, you know, we can we can require that people treat the property better. And the answer is you're dreaming if you think that that's a possibility. Um, but in any event, so he's a lovely dog and he's vegan. He, I mean, they're all vegan, but he an enthusiastic, enthusiastic vegan. vegan. I mean, he he the very first day we got him, 
No problem. Um, I mean, they don't really have a choice because I don't feed them anything. They're vegan food. But, um, but, but from the very first day we had him, boom, he was, he was happy, you know, eating his, his evolution kibble and his Brussels sprouts and his tofu and his, his pasta and stuff. He was, he was happy as a clam. So, but he's a lovely dog. He's sitting with me now. He sits now. We've got him to sit. We've taught him to sit. It's a real challenge because we've had deaf dogs before and we've had blind dogs before. We've never had a dog, which is both, you know, a dog who is both deaf and blind. Um, and, um, but it's, uh, he's a wonderful little guy. He really is just a wonderful, wonderful guy. And um, his brothers and sisters are learning to deal with him because he doesn't react quite the way that um, they're used to. We haven't had a blind dog in a while. Simon died a few years ago. And, um, and you know, uh, th they communicate with each other uh, by looking at e each other's eyes. And, um, and he has really no eyes to, to look. He's not communicating anything in his eyes. He doesn't have, in one socket, he doesn't really even have an eye. In the other one, he has an eye, but it's, it's covered very much by his third eyelid. And there's really nothing to do. And, and it's also not, it's not structurally normal. And so he, he's not, he can't focus particularly I mean, he, we think he may be able to see gradations in light and we, he may be able to see things further off, but he can't see virtually anything close up. So he'll walk into, you know, uh, um, uh, we have to be careful not to leave a chair out from the table. We, you know, because he'll run into it and, things so it, but it's a real challenge because we've not had to we have, it's a challenge <laughs> it's a real challenge to communicate with him but he's a wonderful dog he's 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 a wonderful guy come on come on i wish he could hear me that's the thing that's mm -hmm. frustrating is he doesn't know he's yeah. got a name he's not white dog he has a name and and um and he can't hear us and that's really upsetting but but he's a great little guy All right Okay, well, I think we've got time for one more question. But before yeah, I sure. before I put before I put it to you, uh, we've had Tejas back on the uh, back in the chat room about the uh, the, the record the video recording. He says he, he was referring to video recording with permission, not with. Oh yeah, permission. good, so, good, good, so, good. That's fine. Okay, so one more question then. Uh, uh, this is Floyd You're back again. Uh, given that authentic veganism is ethically based, and given that if someone goes vegan for some other basis. Uh, such as environment or cultural change, and that once vegan, for any reason, a person would likely come round to being an ethical vegan, how do you feel about using environment as a hook if using justice for animals doesn't work? Now, there's a few issues in there, I would imagine. I mean, look, I've never met a vegan who was a vegan for environmental reasons. You know, who, I mean, it's like there are people who think that veganism is a good idea because they're environmental people, but... Um, I've never known anybody who is consistently a vegan for environmental reasons. Um, and I would not, I mean, the thing is, is that, um, you know, I, I would, um, it's sort of like asking me, well, would it be good to promote civil rights? Because if we had less racial unrest, it'd be better for the economy. So, so should we be promoting racial equality for economic reasons that, you know, um, that that'll just be better for the economy. Um, and um, I wouldn't, you know, I mean, my view is racism is bad because it's bad. I don't really care whether it's good for the economy, bad for the economy. It's, you know, now it turns out that um, that animal agriculture is, is environmentally devastating. As a matter of fact, it's, it's, it's a nightmare. Um, so, you know, I do mention it whenever I talk about veganism, I talk about um, the fact that, that uh, animal agriculture is it, it is a disaster for the environment, but I don't, you know. I, I, but I always focus on the, the the moral issue and and the rea and 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 it's actually not true that people who go vegan for environmental reasons, although I don't think anybody goes vegan. I mean, there are people who get who may reduce their animal intake for environmental reasons, um, but I, I don't think that those people. They may or may, I, I don't think there's anything that's sort of necessarily the case that makes them more open to the moral argument just because they're thinking about the environmental argument. I mean, I, my view is, is, you know, I talk about, I talk about morality as the primary matter. I do mention 
the environment? Because I think environment is part of the moral. I mean, it's part of the moral thing. I mean, in, in other words, the environment is what all sentient beings depend on. I don't believe that trees have, have you know, I don't think that trees or plants or water bodies are sentient. And I, I don't believe we can have moral obligations to them. But we do have moral obligations to all the sentient beings, human and non-human, who depend on the environment. So there is a moral issue. There's a moral, moral component to the environmental devastation that animal agriculture causes. That said, I, I don't, you know, think about it this way. Let's assume we're talking about the Holocaust. And actually, you know, the, the reason why the Holocaust was bad was because it had a really bad carbon footprint. I, I think most people would find that um, a peculiar, if not offensive, argument to make. You know, well, you know, they, they transported a lot of people on trains and they were incinerating a lot of people. And it was like, you know, it was, it was putting a lot of soot in the air and it was just environmentally has bad carbon footprint. Maybe true. Maybe true that it was a bad carbon footprint. But that's not why we would argue that the Holocaust was morally wrong. It was morally wrong because it was an obscenity of, of injustice in which innocent people were killed um, because they were Jews or because they were, you know, Romanies or because they were Poles or because they were gay or whatever. The, why, whatever the many reasons that the Nazis used to justify killing people. Um and so I, I wouldn't do that. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, you know, I, I wouldn't, I don't, I don't think it's a good idea to, you know, to, to focus on the environmental issue. You know, you can talk about it because it is a, it has a moral dimension, but it, this is a moral thing. And this, the only way this changes is that people sort of, you know, I have no doubt that the animal products that people eat will decrease over time for reasons other than morality. Most importantly, health. My guess is in another hundred years, we're going to look back at eating if we're here as a res if we're not wiped off the planet as a result of global warming f from animal <laughs> agriculture. Um, you know, we're going to look back on eating animals the way we look at smoking cigarettes now. You know, I mean, many of us smoke cigarettes. You know, when we were younger, and you know, now you look at it and say, "My God, you know, why did I ever do that?" You know, I mean. And, it's really dangerous. And I was like, I can't believe what an idiotic thing I was doing. Um, and I think most people, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, many, unfortunately, a lot of people are still smoking. They tend to be people in lower socioeconomic brackets because they're stressed out because they have, you know, they, they have stresses and there's less emphasis on health. You know, that they're, we pay less attention to them uh, health wise, but, um, and we certainly don't care about, you know, tobacco companies selling cigarettes in third world countries. But, um, uh, but I think it's, you know, we're going to be looking at eating animal products as a really dangerous thing to do, really crazy thing to do. And I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, but, uh, but I, I, I wouldn't promote it for, I mean, my view, you know, you can't, you can't tell people they have a moral obligation to do something that's going to be harmful to them. And so I do think it's important to talk about health, to say not, you know, I, didn't, I never promote the idea that you're going to be healthier if you're a vegan. I think you will. I think the empirical evidence is pretty clear. But my view is, look, I'm not a physician. And as far as the moral argument is concerned, the only thing I have to make, the only only argument I have to make is that you're going to be less healthy. You know, and as long as you don't need it, because you can't tell people they have a moral obligation to do something which is harmful to them. And... And I think that, you know, so, so I do think we need to sort of focus on that. And I think vegans have been really bad uh, uh, about, you know, not not understanding that the primary reason why most people don't go vegan is because they're afraid they're going to, you know, they're, they're afraid of the health problems. I mean, they're afraid they're going to get sick, you know, if they if they stop eating decomposing flesh, cow mucus. Um, and, and and chicken over. They're you make not vegan so attractive. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, you know, the, people get upset. You know, they're, they're worried that if they stop eating this poison, they're gonna, you know, be unhealthy. Um, and I think we need to take that seriously. I think we need to. And one of the things, you know, we try to do is to say to people, look, read enough so that you can like tell people. Don't go give a medical advice to people, but but 
you know, be ready to, you know, to get, give them the, the, you know, the National Institutes of Health uh, uh, website or the National Health Service website in Britain or the USDA website or the, you know, the, the American Dietary Association, uh, all of these groups and organizations and governmental bodies say you can, you can live without eating meat. And many of them say that, you, that, that, that it's actually healthier to not eat meat. So, you know, my view is have that stuff ready for people. But okay. the idea that we're interested in promoting this as an environmental matter, it really strikes me as like saying, well, we ought to be talking about the Holocaust in terms of a bad carbon footprint. I wouldn't do that either. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I think we've, um, we've come to a conclusion. Um, well, I'd like to, I'd like to, I'd like to apologize once again for everything going pear shaped at the beginning. I've still no idea why it happened. <laughs> Let's just hope it doesn't happen again. Um, say thank you to everybody who's uh, been with us this evening um, in the chat room, um, particularly, particularly everyone else. Who's yeah, out. thanks everybody. Yeah, particular thanks to those who asked questions, and apologies for those who asked questions that didn't have them uh, answered. But we may, as usual, put them down um, for use on a future webinar, which is what we usually do. Uh, also, like to thank our team of moderators who've been beavering away in the chat room this evening. That's uh, Francis Vander. Jenny, Jeffrey, and Christina. And finally, this is getting like an Oscar speech, isn't it? And yeah. Finally, yeah. I'd, like, I'd like to thank my grandmother's, my grandmother's pool boy. <laughs> you know. uh, so, but particularly thanks again to Gary Nana. It's been uh, been a really uh, great webinar again, and um, hopefully we'll have another one very soon. So thanks very get much, Gary Nana. Yeah, get out there and advocate. Don't worry about people's Patreon accounts. Get out there and do it. <laughs> No. Yeah. Oh, I, by the way, I, I meant to say this earlier, but I did see I did see a little while ago that somebody had got a GoFundMe uh, account going because they wanted to five hundred dollars to get a vegan tattoo, and they were asking people to pay for it. So, yeah. unfortunately, <laughs> twenty eighteen. Some people think of that as activism. <laughs> anyway, right. with that, we will, and we want to thank yeah. Finley for being such a good boy. He's been sitting here very quietly um, yeah. because even though he's deaf. He does bark, and he <laughs> barks very loudly, all and right. he's very quiet. So in any event, all right, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Get out there, advocate, creative, nonviolent, vegan advocacy. Veganism is a moral baseline. It's a matter of justice. Please get out there, educate, change the world. We can do it. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks very much, Gary and Anna. See Bye. you next time. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye now.